Right. Not for my benefit. I already know it. It's for your benefit. Because when I start to record, even before I started to record, it becomes telepathic. That just means <clears throat> as normal atmos, we are telepathic. We communicate consciousness to consciousness all the time. But people are terrified on earth to really know what each other's saying because probably isn't what the smiley face a person's putting on is really what they're thinking. See the problem? When people aren't honest or they can't be completely sincere and they have guilt or fear, they're hiding certain things. So conversations become quite superficial. And most of your social relationships are superficial. They're deep. Conversations don't go into deep places because they can't. It's the condition of earth people. I suppose I could say that the serenity of being a person goes into, which is a normal state of the Atma when it's unaffected by any negative nature, is what some people call Samadhi or bliss or Nirvana or any of these higher states. And really all that is, is the being stepping out of any programming, even temporarily, any subconscious anything, and being themselves just for a short time. It's blissful, it puts energy in the body, it raises the consciousness, but for most people, they can't stay in serenity of being, which is a higher state than Nerva Kalpa Samadhi or Nirvana or any of those. Because serenity of being is where we earn mastery, where we learn how to maintain not being trapped, not being caught, not setting up the scenario to be caught. Let's say you're a fan of martial arts. Yeah, and you just a 17th degree black belt in something or other. The whole principle of that is, is supposed to be a spiritual discipline, but the principle is you know how to fight something when it crosses your path. Now, the problem is that creates conflict. Eventually, those talents have to be used either in competition or in real life. So it's not the highest form of martial art to be in combat. The highest form of martial art is to be like in Tai Chi, but not like most Tai Chi people. The real masters never get in a fight with anyone. They never set up the scenarios in the first place. They know better. So there won't be an attack on them. Orders that are lower than that consciousness will set up scenarios where eventually they're attacked or they have to defend themselves or defend others. Does that make sense now? Yes. So there's nothing wrong with it because there's supposed to be a spiritual discipline between learning the discipline of martial arts and all that. But it's also a trap for people. You can see that trap in every martial arts movie. Fighting it out. The best, someone wants to challenge them. The trap is laid right out in front of you. Hey, this is a trap. You don't want to get into this. Well, that's like it is for people on earth in almost every field. They get into the trap or the illusion or the maya, maya illusion of conflict. Opposite thinking in their own being good for all life, but I'm terrified of the present and future. And the two are putting out these energies and the omnipresent powers filling them both in equal measure. The time you get to be on earth, the time you've grown up, you put out so much good and bad one time or another, the life is generally neutralized. It's very difficult for a person to choose to move forward, to wake up. And yet all of you have done that. I don't know if you don't really realize yet quite how remarkable that is on a planet light with full of people like they are on Earth because most of them are not going to be supportive of you. Right? Right. No. What? They're afraid. If they're, I won't say any particular religion, but if they're particularly fanatic of some religion or very dedicated, they don't look outside that box. They're afraid to move outside that box because that's where they think they're being saved. Of course, they're not. They just don't know it. They don't die. There's no devil that can permanently kill anybody or the Atma. 
but their fear will compel them to reincarnate with no memory. If not here, somewhere else. It's hard for people to remember, to recall just how ancient they are. How many lives have you lived? How long ago did you start this process? A long, long, long time ago. So I suppose when you cross paths with the first sound behind creation, what some groups call the word or a special word. Oh, I guess this isn't a trap if one enjoys movies about martial arts. No, it's entertainment. <laughs> but if you get caught up in it, then it's, you know, you learn something from it, but it might take up an entire lifetime for what benefit in the end. I got a 19th degree black belt. Well, so what? What do you know about the source? <laughs> what do you know about life from other worlds? Like nothing. Oh, then you haven't made much progress, have you? You see, I can't tell that to people because that'll just insult them. So most of the time I remain silent in the communities where I go, restaurants, and I listen. Because they'll tell you where they are just as plain as day, how limited or how introverted or how apparently extrovert, but their conversations are incredibly superficial. So much so if I listen to them, it's mind numbing. And I just can't listen to people, eavesdrop on people's conversations. It just down my whole day, harsh my buzz, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. I just go somewhere and eat, you know, and I put out the Hue Expansion Ray. I say nothing to anybody except, hi, good to see you. They all know me by name. I'm always kind to them, but I'm not one of them. Not even close. Oh, football. Marshall Bratton, everyone, football. Low. Well, you know, you're going to watch a bunch of grown men bash into each other, chasing after a little oblong ball. That's what men do. And get paid oh, millions. I mean, it's what it is. It came from Rome. Come on, it was the gladiator sports. It's a spin off of gladiator. So is boxing. Mm -hmm. All that stuff, martial arts, spin off stuff, because it was the tyrant rulers like Genghis Khan and people in China that had the martial arts, um, other than the monks, who had the martial arts people on their side to fight their wars for them. So they were trained for honor, honor of their king, honor of their ruler, except in the case of monks who would do it for real spiritual discipline, and then they would get into fights too. Somebody would attack them. Japan would attack China in World War II. I don't know what they did with the martial arts, Shaolin monks, but I don't know if they got into many fights or they just stayed in their monastery, but the Japanese would, you know, come in and raid like any tyrant and, or like the Germans did in Europe not respecters of people. So I don't really, haven't studied it much, so I don't know what people like monk orders did during invasions of their countries. It's interesting, isn't it? Most people never have to think about this or deal with it in their lifetime. But some people do. And some people walk through this unscathed. I would say the most advanced monk type martial arts people escaped any conflict at all. They left Tibet when the Chinese took over, mostly they just went other places, except for the regular people that stayed there and things like that. You know, you don't hear about this stuff in the regular news on nine no. o'clock. You don't hear about it. You don't hear about good cultures that came and went on this planet like Lemuria or Mu. Mm. You won't hear it on any news channel on this planet. Mm -hmm. It's just not entertaining enough for people. It is for me, but for most people, they don't wanna know about that stuff. You can't prove it, I wasn't there. I was just born this life, this is my first life and I'm going straight to heaven. <laughs> Boy, that's an illusion. Holy cow, that's a big one. A lot of people are there, a lot of people on this planet. If a book, any one of religious books say, kill and eat animals, it's God's will. 
That's the way people thought two and 3,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. People are living like that now because they think it's somebody's will. It's not. So they don't know any other options. <clears throat> and down deep, everybody knows there's something not quite right with the way people treat each other and animals and plants and the whole planet is out of balance. It's not right. I can't fix it as one atma. Torellian couldn't fix it by himself. I don't even know if Satnam could fix it by himself. But with a whole host of beings, they could, they could take on that challenge. They could do it. It's a big undertaking, though. Think about the way people are on Earth. And think about people from outside that people on Earth know nothing about and are afraid of coming here and fixing things. What are most people's reactions going to be if they aren't properly prepared? Do you think? Freaking out. They might try to bully them, huh? Well, yeah. Even governments would do that. Yeah. Not anymore because they've already been, governments as far as classified people, have already been down this road of realizing that if push comes to shove, there's nothing anybody on earth can do about someone coming here and taking over if they want to. And in all this time since World War II ended, no one's tried to take this place over. And if they have, you didn't know about it. Hmm? So where's the threat? There was a threat here. Small number, sneaky little buggers, and hanging out in some classified laboratories and all kinds of bad stuff. But those days are gone. Yeah. They're not there anymore. Secret military bases, yes. Little demons from the stars in those bases, no. If you don't hear it from me, you probably won't hear it for a while. Because they're not in those bases anymore. They're not on Earth. They're not even in our solar system. If you haven't noticed, you really don't hear a lot about a whole lot of UFO ships and abductions and people being picked up. That's 25 years ago when that stopped. Mm -hmm. Why? Why did it stop? You think people aren't interested in us blowing ourselves up or not? It's pretty entertaining. Go watch the dumb humans blow themselves up with hydrogen bombs. Oh, it's a great show. Problem with that is it affects life in other realities. Too. Yeah. yeah. And they, they, they won't tolerate that. Fortunately for us, we'd all be toast. Mm. There's more involved in the universe than one little frickin' planet Earth. We're just one little dust ball out of trillions, and we're important as anybody else, but just one planet. And most, in fact, everybody on Earth did not come from here. They just don't remember. They don't remember their lives out among the stars or in other dimensions. Go go to your local restaurant and start having a conversation with the people sitting next to you and see how much of this they can relate to. No. Okay. <laughs> or I'll sit in a restaurant and they'll look at the series agenda. Oh, is that a book about Jesus? <laughs> uh, uh, well, no, but there's a lot of hidden truth in it. You can't really, you can't get into it. Because if you say it's about extraterrestrials who are interested, the greater God coming here and saving this planet, that's when they stop the conversation with you. And they stop being nosy while you're sitting there minding your own business and they go about their business. It's that scary to them. I get to be This often happens when I'm not trying to meet anybody or talk with anyone. They just come up and sit down or say hi and they're being nice but they have a hidden agenda for talking to me they want to see if i'm saved <laughs> what am i going to tell them how about nothing how about nothing general superficial conversation that's fine with me but as brief as i can make it so i know all of you can relate to this in your own way right yeah of course you can. Your atom is your conscious. You can't ignore this stuff. 
everybody knows it. It isn't putting a judgment on other people or um, see, acting as if we're superior or something because they do what they do on earth and we don't. It just means that we have to learn how to master certain reactiveness or reactions to what people around us do so that we don't get caught in the martial arts battle. See my point? Yeah. Because that puts us right here in that energy and then we have to shake it off and go into contemplation and, you know, detach ourselves from being reactive to such things. Now, I don't know about you, but I've not been able to control a hurricane the last time I looked. <laughs> I mean, I've tried. <laughs> nope. How about a tornado? I'll just stop that. Nope. How about an earthquake? You settle down. <laughs> nope. Yeah, you can't do it. Uh, there are beings who can. As you know what they are, they're silent mentors. <laughs> They could stop any earthquake, any volcano, anything, anywhere, anytime, instantly, without effort. But they generally do not interfere in nature. They hold it all. But they don't intervene in small ways like that. What if you ask them, Mr. Lemon, would they intervene? Oh, let me see. How many silent mentors do you know you can go up to and ask anything? Just one. Oh, does he talk to you? No. Oh, that doesn't mean I ask the question. Though. That's why they're called silent mentors. Because <laughs> oh, well, they, 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 they normally they normally don't interact with us at all. You won't even know they're there. There is one place where we're going, which is the whole point of this, where we can interact with such beings. They won't interact with us down here. They're so far removed from people even being afraid of extraterrestrials. They're so far beyond master teachers as you would think of them. So far beyond rulers of galaxies or governors of galaxies or galactic alliance people. And they have no other reaction normally with any of that. They're just busy holding it all together. But these beings have absolutely unlimited freedom to be anywhere instantly, no ships needed, no bodies, carry out a mission anywhere. They could be a bottle cap, a fly on a wall, anything. And you'd never know it. You wouldn't. And then they'll just go about their business and keep moving. You wouldn't even know what they've done. One thing this work imparts to people on Earth for the first time, because it only happened for the first time for this planet pretty recently, was the permanent cessation of cyclic polar flips of this planet. If they had not done that, we would all be gone now. Forget about nuclear war. Flipping of the poles overnight in 24 hours wipes out all life on the surface of the Earth and a lot of sea life. Planet's fine, the people, no. Gone, done, 24 hours, wiped out. So planetary polar flips are not exactly beneficial for people who want to live their lives and raise kids, so to speak. And we would already have been through that had this not been changed. And it was changed so that we would have the opportunity to begin to work towards making this planet normal like other worlds already are and have been for millions of years. It's an opportunity for us to grow up. And we happen to be on Earth when we're waking up in this way, which means when you go visit your astral body, Inez, you become aware that that's your astral body. You told me that. I didn't say it to you. Now, this is important because then you begin to realize that as an individual being, you're multidimensional. You're running a lot of stuff you don't remember. And it's you. It's you here. It's you on the astral, causal, mental, etheric. It's you when you go up to the void or beyond. It's you when you go to Norexalum or Zetronami 1. Or is he in Tarnamon one or Oceana or one of the headquarters of the silent mentors in our Milky Way galaxy, in the physical universe, on a planet that even the Galactic Alliance cannot detect or see? These things are real. These things are the way the universe was created. Just because you may not remember them or are still too afraid in some area or another to recall them, 
they still have to be integrated when we become aware of this stuff in our natural lives here. We still have to live practical lives. You know, pay your bills and make money and all that stuff. It's boring as hell, but it's not really what we should be doing. No one should have to pay for the right to be born on a planet. The religions and governments think you should have to pay for that right to them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not true, but it is what the mass of people on the planet, as much as they hate it, support. It gives them a false sense of security. And until they're able to feel secure within themselves as a being, they're going to rely on some outside force, political or religious, to take care of that, our lives for them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that does not mean direct experiences in their path. Not until they question something's not right with their faith or something's not right with their government or something's not right with the way they believe because it's holding them back because they're not getting anywhere. They're just not. That's when you find the hue. Or I should say really the hue finds you because it's already running through you. When you wake up to its awareness of it, it's already there. It has been supporting you. You're made of the same thing. So it's not like you're becoming aware of something for the first time you are not. Or already source energy. You cannot become perfect in the future, some body in some lifetime. That's impossible. I'm talking about bodies becoming perfect. I know of people with bodies that are 10,000 years old that have an age. They're not perfect. And when they get tired of them, they'll just disintegrate them and move on. And I know this because I did it. I know this because every one of you did it. For whatever reason, we ended up on this planet with a little to no memory. Well, it must be God's will. That's what it is. I made a contract. That's what it was. Yeah, I said, Archangel Michael, I'll just, I don't want to use that term. Let's just use an archangel. I want to go to Earth and know nothing so I can get perfect. Okay, Judy, just go right ahead on to Earth and we'll take care of everything. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> And off they go. Do, 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 do. <coughs> and then they're born and they go, oops. Oh, no. I did it again. Go to Earth with no memory? What? So we're on this journey to recover what we were made to forget, either by us to ourselves long before you were implanted, or to recover what you knew before you got caught. That's a hard thing to swallow when you're waking up on an earth like this and you learn none of it growing up as a child. I mean, none of it. And yet, while that's going on, you carry this wealth of information and wisdom inside. It's not dead or buried or destroyed. It is suppressed one way or another, but that's all. It's still there. So... When we imagine being above the body, looking down on it, this is the simple act of daydreaming and everybody on earth knows how to do that. This is something of a higher faculty people bring into this life. When everything else is closed down, they used to know. They know how to daydream. Now think about how high of a faculty that is that's on, but not consciously on. People dream about going to the store to get a bag of potato chips. By God, they get in that car and the body follows and goes and gets those chips. But if they didn't see it first, the body would go nowhere and they would not leave or move. Bodies don't run themselves. The bodies you have do not run themselves. They only operate and breathe and run and heart move because you're putting a certain energy stream into it through the pineal gland, the center of the brain which is how you control a human body. There's a controlling gland, the center of the brain, tied to the entire upper nervous system, brain and nervous system and spinal cord, and all that. So when we imagine going to the store, people on earth are taught because they don't know any better. 
after getting PhDs, they don't know any better. Oh, there's something in the brain. We think it's over there, right? It's right over here. There it is. That's where you imagine from. I say, oh, really? Is there a motion picture camera in those brain cells that project an image onto other brain cells? Is that how it works? And they go, they don't know what to say because they don't know that that doesn't work like that. They don't know that they're actually seeing where they daydream somewhere or they could not even be, be conscious of it. If I imagine writing about something on another planet, I have to actually be in the experience to write it because it's not in here. I didn't learn it growing up here. There's no university that teaches anywhere, any place on the planet. So if people really understood this simple fact that when they visualize something, they're actually seeing it somewhere, they'd be much more amenable to being conscious about what they choose to put their attention on. Because wherever you put your attention, there you are. Isn't that interesting? Good or bad or both. Most people are busy putting it like a yo-yo. Good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad, all day long, emotionally, mentally. And it just grounds them to the earth so they can't even think outside the box. Well, we're thinking outside the box because we can. If you don't know you can, you won't do it. That's pretty simple. <laughs> I won't do it if I don't know about it. So, what is the first sound behind all of existence and why is it important to people right here on earth? To cats, to dogs, to birds, to bees, to plants, to animals, to hurricanes, to tornadoes, to ocean currents, to sea life. What is it? Why is it important? How do we contact it? How do we be in touch with it? so that our consciousness can actually wake up and change. That's what we want, every one of us. When I go into the hue, I'm not the only one doing it. There are beings not native to Earth and not from Earth who rarely, if ever, step foot on planet Earth for now that do this with me. And so there is a collective connection between us. And that makes the energy of the, the amount of hue we can channel or be co-create with much bigger, much larger. The intelligence goes way up. You start to plug in with people like Torellian and Ron Boo and Opelum and Etta and Din, Light C and Sat Nam and you're plugging in some pretty amazingly beyond genius level consciousness. And now I'm simply muting a few mics. Yeah, we're good now so that they, we get a good sound recording quality as we go on the journey. So when you close your eyes, what are you doing? What is it we're doing when we close our eyes? It isn't taught on Earth. It just isn't. Sorry, it's not. You're shutting off a part of the brain, basically just turning off the light switch. It's not dead. It's not harmed. You're shutting out all input through the most important faculty you have, if you have eyes, to receive information from the world. And when you do that, most people aren't aware that they open up a different doorway through the pineal gland. They begin to see what they have in that case. The only thing they have access to is imagination. And imagination is not made up in the human brain at all. There's no brain, mind, emotional thing stored in the human brain that you call emotion or thought. It's not limited to one little brain. You can't know anything with that thing. That's just for running a body that you're running as an animal. So we go into the sound because we come from the sound. We come from the first sound. We come from the prime creator or source itself because we are it. We have always been it. We have never not been it. And we were it before the lower worlds of time and space were even built. This is a fact. It cannot be hidden. You can shove it into a rug, but eventually it's going to catch up with you. Because underneath it all, we are the knowers. Not the believers, 
it's a good place to start. But we come to the knowers when we begin to have experience to let ourselves know. That means we have to at some point decide we know or you will not know. If you're waiting for the master to give you, hit you on the head with a baseball bat and say, now you know, and your brain rattles and you go, yeah, I guess so. I don't want to get hit on the head again, so now I know. It won't happen. You have to begin to deliver to yourself what you once knew with confidence. It has to begin to take over and take the place of what we used to be put as energy and imagination into fear and doubt and negative things. In a positive and negative stream of energy in the lower worlds of time and space, what manifests is what we put our attention on at any given moment. Generally, if people are thinking good thoughts and imagining good things for their family, and 90% of their day is pretty positive and most people aren't there, then they're gonna have a pretty good life but there's always going to be that 10% that they drop into or out of from time to time, and that keeps them kind of grounded to the earth. And basically, it keeps people afraid to journey beyond the stars, because we're supposed to be doing that in any life where we are running a body. That should never have stopped. So it has to begin again. You It's all the hue on different levels. So you could say the silent mentors are keeping the hue vibrating on a certain time rate on one level and a little faster time rate on another. Now this is behind molecules which are vibrating on different time rates. So in the astral plane in general, the time rate of matter is much faster than in the physical universe. But there's levels to each of these planes, too. And when we get into the void, which is pure hue, pure first sound energy, source energy, there's no negative nature whatsoever. And you can't bring anything with you there. That stays turned off with your closed eyes back on Earth. The body goes into a natural trance state we call sleep from off world. Now, people on Earth call it sleep and identify with going unconscious with the body when they put it to bed at night. But that's not really what's happening. 
The body is being put on automatic, set to run on automatic mode. The snoring, the breathing, the heart work, the breathing, the, the lungs, the blood circulation, the heart pumping. These are all automatic systems. Because as you have an energy connection to this body through the pineal gland, you know how to run a body and be all the way in source itself for a short time. We all know how to do it. Now, if you know how to do that, how can you be so unconscious on planet Earth? Of course, I know the answer to that, don't I? It's complicated. And it didn't happen to people overnight. It didn't happen to people over a billion years, much longer than that, to get to a point where we don't know anything running a body on Earth. And yet, we've retained the ability to run something as complex as a human nervous system and not even know how we're doing it. What? See? The hue, this omnipresent power, what people call divine spirit, pray to it all day long, is actually that energy in space that little galaxies float in, and it's a white golden light everywhere. More advanced quantum physicists and astrophysicists and physicists in general today understand that that dark matter they used to see in the universe, it was not molecular. They thought it was dark matter, some big mystery, is actually source living energy. And without relating and co properly cooperating with it, you will not travel the stars, you will not travel to other dimensions as the Atma, because we have to move in that medium, whether it's in a spaceship or by ourselves, as a spherical being. So as spherical beings, we move easily in that energy between spherical planets, spherical sun systems. Even galaxies are made up of seers, turning in like a plate, with a big congestion of stars in the center, they have arms that go out and they spin in a circle, creating an electromagnetic field so it can float in relative position to other galaxies. Silent mentors maintain all of this for everyone. They don't have normally an interaction with humans on Earth at all, any, in any way, usually. It may be in a rare occasion or two in the past, but it wouldn't be worth mentioning, but how are you going to prove it? Who are you going to tell? And they don't tell anybody. And they're not going to stand witness and say, we did this and we did that. That isn't there. They have no interest in that kind of thing. When you're near the ceiling, there is a man and a woman. Consider them master teachers, but just people. Nice people. They didn't grow up on Earth. They don't think like you. They're not stuck like you. They don't have subconscious fear, doubt, or any of that. They didn't grow up on Earth. They weren't programmed that way. So don't think of them as being uh, sympathetic in a way to the way you are. Compassionate, I would say, is close to the way they are, but more like respectful because respect is divine love. No matter what anybody thinks about it, it's not worshiping someone or putting a God on a pedestal so far away you will never, never reach it. Doesn't matter how many times you die and leave a body, you will never go there. Putting that on a pedestal because it won't allow you to go there that way. That's negative. It's not positive. People do that out of fear of being put in hell or fear of something. Now, you can't blame them. I don't. Not the way it's been done to them. The thing of it is, what was done to people on Earth was not done on Earth. It was done before they were put here. And in the end, way down deep, beyond it all, when you're back home in the source, you realize you're responsible for all of this our little part in it. And we have the opportunity to help change it for the first time in several hundred billion years. That is what the Hue Expansion Ray is about. Not just the Hue, the omnipresent first sound derived from the word human, but the Hue Expansion Ray. 
That didn't get created in the lower worlds. The Galactic Alliance didn't come up with it. Torellian didn't come up with it. It was developed and tested above the void. Now it's being instrumentally instituted in the lower worlds of time and space. And it only works one way. That man and woman about six feet tall who always appear to be about 36 will show you a human-like form that is flawless. Perfectly handsome, perfectly beautiful. Because they have no negative nature. Their planets have no negative nature, not like Earth. And their genetics, their body forms bear this out. So they operate to keep your subconscious fears, whatever they may be, turned off for the journey. This is easy for them, instantaneous, effortless, because they can't react to what you would react to. They're not reactive. They don't have anything subconscious in them to react off what you would react off of. So they're able to maintain this lack of fear just for a short time. Of course, they are a spherical being, very brilliant, very beautiful, hovering to each side of you, showing you a body form that looks human, but it's not made of DNA or atoms. And you're showing them the same thing because when your subconscious mind is turned off, we know how to do this with each other. And I will show people a perfectly handsome 36-year-old type body, just like you will show that to the people who are keeping your subconscious problems turned off for now. And we find ourselves in space, standing around in a circle around Ambassador Torellian of the Say Race human race. He serves as an example He serves as an example of what human beings originally came from long ago, billions of years ago. Human beings did not originate in the Milky Way galaxy, much less on Earth. Now, all your people are being taught about that garbage is so far from right, it's, it's ridiculous. How do you get this many different types of races of humans living on one planet in one atmosphere, evolving here naturally, circling around one sun with a dead moon? That is not possible. People do not realize how ancient humans are. There are many others, some more ancient than us. But humans are very old. <clears throat> Trillian immortalized his physical body Oh, a little over a billion Earth years ago, his whole race, after serving in the astral worlds, the levels, physical worlds, and bringing DNA races and species up to a point of nervous system capability that Atlas could run them, develop space travel, have them pilot spaceships, all that kind of thing. So this was ancient, not new at all. And out here in space, in the omnipresent hue, which is a golden white light everywhere we see is the Atma, not black. It isn't black at all. But human eyes cannot detect it. Human eyes on Earth with two-stranded DNA, for the most part, most of the time, cannot see into this. It requires being able to see with a little bit higher frequency capability. Probably a cat could see it. Maybe a dog too, but cats can certainly see it. They probably wonder why their humans can't see what they can see. They have no way of communicating it with you. But it's true. They have kind of eyes that these, uh, you know, with the pupils open wide like a slit, like a cat or a tiger. They're able to gather more light, which is why they can generally see better at night. They got night vision goggles built in. Torellian always shows a form of it being 18 feet tall because that's what his body was before it was 
dematerialized and stored. They had evolved to the point where they already were pure energy, of course, like we are, but they were able to make the conscious transition and dematerialize their bodies, store them in a teardrop near the outer first yellow layer around the white core of their being, and they were plugged into the omnipresent power. So when they plug into it, they can draw on it, manifest a body form to show you. It's made of pure energy well-dressed, looks handsome, whatever it is. And when they're done with it, they put it away. They don't have the problem of feeding it or going to the bathroom or any of that kind of nonsense. Watching it grow old because the telomeres on the DNA shrink when the cells divide, which is not normal at all. That is not the way human beings were, were founded billions of years ago. This came along much later. What happened and why? Terrellian, this big huge atma hovering above this body form he's showing you, has his two thumbs up with a golden white light around his hands, a little sphere of light. It's a little brighter than the hue in space around us. Master Ramu, who is stationed on Earth in the third higher parallel dimension, in a city called Agamdes is showing you a body form that he has on planet Earth, stationed there. But he's not from Earth either. None of you are either. You might as well get that in your head right now. You're not from this planet, you never were. You didn't evolve on this planet in its primordial past. You know, as amoebas getting up and becoming fish and their flippers were walking like feed. And then they grew into dinosaurs and somehow they just devolved into human beings, popped out of the ground. No. All the races on Earth developed on whole worlds with trinary sun systems. And not just in the Milky Way. And they have more than two stranded DNA. The say rays, 12. And that was a billion years ago. So you get an understanding out here of what people on Earth need to recover. And it's everything. Because right now they know practically nothing. Or they tell themselves they know nothing. Or they're afraid to know anything. But it's only some kind of fear that trauma they went through somewhere in their past that has made them like this. And not all of that certainly was done of free will to people. Look at the world, the way people lie and cheat and deceive between governments and religions. What is that a manifestation of? Not the truth, no. But if that's all you have access to, that's all you have access to. What choice do you have? until some, for some reason you all made a choice to step across a certain threshold. Didn't matter how enlightened or free you were, you still had aberrations or subconscious primary and secondary implants or that. But you made a choice that required that you step forward in the hue despite what was done to you and irregardless of what was done to you. And you were able to over, master over that stuff. That's what brought you here. That's what brought me here. And you know, Ramu has a maroon collared robe he's standing there showing you what his body looks like on Earth. It looks real out here. But he's standing there in space. He doesn't have to breathe. He doesn't feel heat or cold or radiation from the sun. He's got his crystal staff. He's holding his earmark, his trademark as a being. And out in space, further away from Torellian's master Blue skin, slightly pointed ears, long jet black hair to his shoulders, still holding his right hand up so that you will pay attention that his webs between his fingers. He's human, you could mate with him. Not that they'd want to mate with a woman on earth or anything, but the genetics is so close throughout the different races and species in the universe because the Ceres DNA is in all of those beings. You got to go back a long way in galactic history to find that out.
Et and Din are DREN, silica-based, not carbon-based. Their atomic structure, their nuclear, their DNA is made of silica, like quartz or sand. But living, you know, the first and the only species I know of, at least in this galaxy, that has a natural ability to levitate and fly through the air from their tail. A gra antigravitic field is set up around a charge down the length of their tail and it sets up an antigravitic field around them just like it would around a spaceship. It's limited to travel within an atmosphere, in an oxygen atmosphere. They can't travel out in space without a spacesuit any more than you could. But they're master teachers and they are not human. Might as well get used to it. There's a lot of life out there in the greater God. And the greater God is not on Earth. It's out there. It's out among the stars and the galaxies and the multiple dimensions and up through the void and up into the Hue Expansion Ray Academy and up into Ogham Purusha's realm and into the ocean of sound and light and beyond, even to the realm of the silent mentors and beyond that to the Hue Expansion Ray plane itself. These places are there. Every one of you came from above the void originally. So why, when people don't ask the right questions living out a life on earth, they never get an answer. And they live old, grow old, and die in some fear, and they're put right back here somewhere else. Generally, they don't want to have a memory. And there's subconscious stuff that compels them to think that way as well. When you come to a point where you begin to decide that's not for you, you've had enough of that. You've been doing it for billions of years. It's about time to really change. That's when you find the hue, or it finds you. It begins to take notice of you for the first time in billions of years. Because it knows you can't die. Bodies come and go. They're a dime a dozen. But then you begin to realize you have never been a body, you aren't one now, and you never will be. There are other beings here besides the masterful Galactic Alliance personnel standing beside each one of you, including me. There's one beside Susan, Marshall, Margaret, Inez, Lee, and Anna couple. Usually a couple because it works to balance the energy best. And as a couple, <clears throat> they work together in harmony without subconscious influences to make sure what their job is for you gets done effectively for now. They don't invade your mind. They're not reading your thoughts. They don't care about any of that. But we are telepathic with them. Now, this is a pure form of communication in the hue between us and source. It cannot be perverted by negative thoughts. It cannot be invaded by negative things, beings, or technology. It is master over such things, and it always has been. We're supposed to be that way. We're meant to be conscious, trustworthy, co-creators with the source behind all life because we are still at that source even now. There are four silent mentors, two couples hovering above Et and Din, and above them sought known. This is what they started this last year. Don't ask me why, because they never did this before in all of the history of the multiverse, as far as I know. There's this golden white light whirling clockwise hourglass like vortex above Sat Nam. Above him is a bit of big, beautiful, multifaceted, luminous Atma, of course. And there's a blue-green light whirling around it like water. It isn't water, of course. It's energy. It comprises the colors and energies of the purest part of each of the lower planes of time and space and creates a field of energy around this golden-white portal so that we can move through it without getting sidetracked into all these lower planes where positive and negative things rule people. And you have bodies in those planes, and we don't want to get caught up with them right now either. So understand this. In the astral plane, where all emotion comes from, you have a life you're living there. 
It's not like the life you're living here. It lives much longer than Earth terms. All emotion moves matter in that universe. There's a causal body above that where cause and effect is the thing that moves things. And there's a mental body where thought, instant thought moves matter. There's an etheric body where it's more of a, I don't want to say subconscious, it's more of a deeper link between running bodies and what you are above the void. Bodies that are transparent. They aren't even molecular in the sense of what you understand on Earth. People have these visions of these transparent, luminous bodies where you can see all the chakras, wings, and all that stuff. That's basically etheric. Nobody needs wings. They can move instantly anywhere without flapping something. But that's how people picture them. Because they can get around instantly, so people think they must be flying like a bird. No. That would slow them down and limit them to the atmosphere of whatever molecules made up those wings, if you catch my drift. So we're going to bypass all of that. And we're going to go up to source and we're going to come back we're going to visit a couple of planets in the physical universe of the Milky Way. Create a triangle of energy experience between source the Hugh Expansion Ray Academy. We're going to touch with Ogham Purusha. I'm just giving you a heads up so you begin to pre-imagine and pre-plan and pre-think this stuff. To be part of it. To co-create it. Because all of you have the ability to see into the multiverse and know things. Even if you doubt yourself now, I don't know how to see Nerexel. I don't know how to see Zetronami 1. I don't know how to see Oceana. I don't know how to see Earth as it is in the third higher parallel dimension. I blah, 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 this and that. Of course you do. That's just subconscious stuff. It's in the way. It says, no, you can't do that. Uh-uh. Got to be practical. Keep your feet on the ground. What's the point of that? Your feet are already ground, glued to the Earth. Can't get more grounded to earth than people are. There's really only one way for people now, and that's onward and upward. They can't go any lower. So <laughs> returning to source only makes sense. You... There's a hue. Coming down through that vortex, through the being we know of as Satnam, down through Torellian, through Eta and Din, through four silent mentors that are hovering is a couple, two couples, kind of like a square, just below Satnam, male and female, four different colored gowns on, pastel, white light for a face, long hair to their shoulders, different colors, different skin colors, but these aren't physical bodies. And above them is hovering a much larger atma, four times bigger, maybe three times bigger than Torellian, but four times. These are silent mentors. And they have been working with Satnam, coming down here into the top of the physical universe and going with us on these journeys back to where they reside. They do not mix it up with us on Earth. Don't bother trying. They have a place set up now where we can rub shoulders with them, and it's not in space or on planet Earth. Far too advanced for people on Earth. Heck, they're probably, they're far too advanced for the Galactic Alliance people, and they're pretty paradisical. So think of it that way. Why would they go with us? Hmm, big question. Maybe if you ask the right answers with some courage, you can get the right answers. See, and if we don't ask the right questions, the Hugh's going to sit there and support you and do nothing for you. It's not going to do anything. <laughs> it's waiting for us to begin to have to show the slightest flicker of waking up from a deep psychotic amnesia. That's all it's waiting for. When we start to work with the Hugh, we are connecting directly to Source. 
And whether we know it or not, no matter where we live or what our conditions are in life, we are beginning to tell it we want to go home. We want to complete this journey. We want to run bodies in all the planes in a conscious, enlightened manner and be co-creators with it. That's what you're telling it. And it listens. There are beings in between the source like Satnam or Torellian or Agam Purusha that listen and hear and see the slightest innuendo coming from an atmos stuck on earth that they want to recover. They want to contribute something back to the source, not just go up there and say, God, give me this and give me that. Any bozo on the bus can do that. Doesn't change the world at all. Which means we're supposed to go back to the source and help change and bring back that consciousness with us to this life on earth. If we don't do that, how's it going to get here? The reason there's an energy around Torellian's thumbs is because it's coming from above that void, beyond Satnam, beyond the silent mentors, from above the void, in the void and beyond it. And it's simply putting a little finer energy of the hue around us, like the hull of a spaceship, transparent. So we can, in a sense, stay collectively around Torellian and go on this journey. And we're moving upward, right upward following Satnam. The silent mentors have already disappeared up through that opening. They're just gone. They don't need to travel through doorways. They're just here or they're there or they're over there. They have no such limitations held over their heads at all. Why they're rubbing shoulders with us is probably so we get an idea of what our potential is. I ask the right questions. I get the answers. Doesn't mean I can do what they do, but I get the answers. And then I can work toward that. The silent mentors are gone. First thing we see is a hand white tunic dress from his waist to his bare ankles, two gold bracelets on his upper arms, bronze skin, beautiful, glowing kind of golden eyes, not yellow, bald, strongly built. He's simply moving up into the vortex. Remember, the, the, the spherical being he is, is hovering above this form he's showing us. The spherical being you are is hovering above the form you're showing each other. And in this case, it's all about 36-ish. Young adult, perfectly handsome, perfectly beautiful. Now think, if you were awake enough, you could superimpose that form right over the body you have on Earth. And it would become that. Now, why wouldn't you let yourself do that on a world full of people like they are on Earth? Because if you did that and showed it off, you'd probably get shot or arrested or put into some underground facility out of fear, so far removed from people's understanding that you really can't play that way on earth yet, even if you can do it. Or you get yourself in trouble. Perfectly okay to do that on a planet that doesn't have its system run by fear. Then you don't have the problem. So nothing's really keeping these kinds of experiences from us. We've had them in the past long ago. We know what they are already. Each one of us know this. What's an immortalized body like? You've already done it. Been there, done that. I don't think you've ever experienced in several hundred billion years making a body like Torellian or the Seyrays do. Because they dematerialize and store it in a teardrop. Why do they show that to you? Because it's potential. The way they teach is not like on Earth. The hue flows through them in a much larger volume, unhindered by negative things. And then it flows through us. So we rub shoulders with them. And now as a group, we're moving up this into this vortex. And as we move up this hourglass-shaped funnel, you can see right through it. 
And you can realize you can see levels upon levels upon levels of galaxies, each getting bigger the higher we go, brighter. And then we're suddenly into this void, this pale blue luminosity everywhere. And we're moving ever upward through this vast space. There's nothing in here, nothing here that you can see. No beings, no physical matter, no structures. There are beings here, but they don't make their presence known yet. And so we're moving very fast following Satnam, who's just flying up above us. And we are in the pure hue. The sound is that of like faint bagpipes and a high note of a flute, very pure. There's no negative nature, no moons, no planets, no suns, no stars, just a group of beings around Torellian, following Satnam. Silent mentors are gone. In the distance, you see a beach begin to loom before us as we swiftly approach it. And you can see this beach spreads out as far as you can see in each direction and curves inward. This means that it's circling some huge landmass floating above the top of the void. And Satnam is hovering above these jungle trees on this big, huge, curved beach. And he's pointing to the trees and you see that they are transparent. There are all kinds of fruit trees and botanical paradise trees and you know, palm trees and all kinds of things, but they're transparent energy, multicolored energy is moving up and down the trunks. Everything's conscious here. This is pure positive. This is the first realm of the higher worlds. Satnam's realm. Satnam, true name, true identity, however you want to say it, it has multifaceted meanings, but it means I am source. This is a prototype. It is not a human body made of matter, but it looks human, what he shows us. And this is where people get confused and think that this physical body is made in the image of God. It's not. It's a machine. Very sophisticated. But up here, what we show each other isn't even made of DNA or, or atoms. It's made of the pure hue. We always have been made of the pure hue. We didn't come into being from some being sitting on the throne and said, oh, there's Susan and Inez and Margaret, and there's Marshall and there's Anna. Boop, there's Scott. We were there at the beginning. We were there when the lower worlds of time and space were built. You need to know this to play in the higher worlds while you're running bodies in the lower planes of time and space. It's consciousness. Imagining Satnam's beach is the first step to crossing the border into the higher realities. No one crosses that border without Satnam's awareness. He serves as a, uh, make it nice, a governor of this realm. But he's so much more than that. This being is beyond the gods that people worship and their names on earth. It's beyond what beings worship as God on other worlds and countless billions of them. He's not made of lower energy matter. He doesn't have a physical body at all. As we move over the top of the trees and these birds surround us with long V-shaped split tails, rainbow colored feathers, just gorgeous, blended very subtly. Twin sets of bird wings, like a dragonfly, but bird wings, big blue eyes. They're singing with male and female voices, beautiful, perfect vocal cords. And they're simply singing the hue because the sound <coughs> emanating from the atma plane into the void comes from them. Think about what I just shared with you. Not human beings, these Higher beings hovering above these bird bodies that are photographic memories, telepathic. They aren't even matter bodies. And they're able to create the combined sound that powers as it moves through them the void. That power comes originally from a transmitter called Agam Purusha. That's many planes above Satnam's realm. 
So as we move over the top of the jungle trees, you can see into the distance, way into the distance, over this diagonal mountain range with snow covering blue stone and the palatial estate along its base, way in the distance, way into the center of this massive floating landmass is a tower. It's, it's bigger than anything on earth. It's like this blue glass. It has a fountain two thirds of the way up in it. It's a device comes to a minaret point, it's literally glowing. There's a blue, white blue shaft, light golden shaft of light coming down into it. Has a blue tinge to it actually, coming from the light reflecting through this transparent material. Now that's down in the very center of the heart of the Atma plane. They can't be determined in terms of billions of years, light years. It's farther and deeper and wider than that. From that tower where we're hovering above it now around Torellian, you can see oceans surrounding parts, eighths of the entire circular floating Satnam realm. Each ocean has a different color blended into the next. And each bunch of land going to that ocean between this tower and that ocean has unimaginable numbers of beings and animals and things represented here with Atlas running them so that they can exchange here and learn what life is in the multiverse below the void so they can come to respect all of it so they can become trustworthy co-creators with source. This is the training that people get in the Atma plane where Satnam is. But that's not where we're stopping. We're moving up this tower, up this shaft of light, and this spaceship of white golden light, until we're suddenly shot up through another opening that appears in the high atmosphere of the Atma plane, like a donut of tiny little blue stars whirling clockwise, and we're shot out into an incredibly bright cobalt blue atmosphere, and that vortex closes below us. We're moving into the distance towards what looks like a huge floating circular landmass, hovering in this expansive cobalt blue light. It has a white diamond-like beach glowing surrounding it, circumference, and a blue-green ocean wave that's constantly moving. It appears near the shore and crashes gently on the beach, and it always circles the outer circumference and never stops moving. It's like creating a type of a, not an electromagnetic field you'd find around a galaxy, but an energy field that holds this place in place. The silent mentors are responsible for that. In the distance in the center of this landmass are six snow-covered mountain peaks, white with blue stone. We can hover above it and look down and see that there is in the valley circular valley between these six mountains, there is a blue-green luminous lake circling a, like a white disc-shaped island. There's a blue glass administration tower coming out of the outer circumference of this stone or sand. It comes up very tall between these mountains to a flattened oval. There's a fountain in it and up to a minaret point. The same channel of golden white light is coming through this point in uh, Satnam's realm. It goes through the void and goes all the way down through the one in the Atma plane where Satnam is, and it goes down through the void and all the way down through the axes of galaxies, and it's distributed. It creates a doorway between the hue in a higher plane and the hue in a lower plane, like a concentric generator. And so we are now moving up through this energy above this tower. And as we do, we begin to see the entire Atma plane shrink to a point as we're moving very fast and then it vanishes. The next thing we see is we're moving gradually into a fire energy. We've passed through a number of divisions. There's no doorways or barriers between them like the lower planes, but they change subtly. And so now you're coming into the realm of Agam Purusha. 
This is a realm of fire and orange and yellow and green and blues and moving and whirling and all over the place. No solid buildings except for one thing, a big, massive, silver golden tree like a fir tree. Roots sinking beyond view below this fire energy. Top of the tree extending beyond the range of vision. And there's this huge spherical being hovering there. If you weren't with me and other people, they'd scare the hell out of you. But this guy's not to be feared. This one being regulates the raw power of eternity from above here and generates it down very carefully, all the way down through the plains, through the U Expansion Ray Academy, through Satnam's realm, through the void, and so forth. And the silent mentors, who you can see dozens of them moving through this energy around Agam Purusha, fading in and disappearing, coming and going, out giving us a second thought to us. Always moving. So the first thing that I did, I was compelled to do, was to befriend this being, to become friends, to ask to be his buddy. I was sincere, honorable. I really wanted to be his friend. I knew he didn't have any, really. Who's going to be friend with such a being? Hmm? So this started something different. You have the opportunity to befriend this being. Don't waste it. We do not pass beyond his realm through that tree of life and go higher without his permission. That is impossible. So we have to become co-creators and respectful of such beings. They already respect us or he wouldn't be here. The vibration is compelling us forward and this whole golden white energy surrounding us is moving right through the branches of this tree, right through the needles and each needle has a symbol, an image of a world somewhere. You can see the Atma plane and whole branch of this tree. And then there's the trunk of the tree. It's a white golden light roaring up what looks like redwood, almost like a redwood how do you describe a silver tree that has a redwood? It's not really a solid bark. It's an energy conduit, a doorway. And we're moving in it and up the trunk of this tree and we're shot upward. Which means we've already been given permission by Agam Purusha to journey home. And when we come out the other end of that doorway, we're moving towards what looks like this unbelievably vast galaxy of stars floating in an even brighter luminous cobalt blue atmosphere. The sound emanating around us is beyond human descriptions, beyond human orchestras. It's absolutely heart-throbbingly drawing us toward the center. The source sound itself. And we're moving through what we thought were stars or individual beings who make up the components, just like suns and planets do of a galaxy down the physical universe. But they make up this galaxy that circles around a void in the center. And in the center of this void is a white island. And hovering above it, in the center of it, is this massive atma. Looks like one of us, but more layers to it, vastly larger than we are. But when we look at each other, we look the same. We know we come from that. You can't help it. The individual beings that are circling around here making up the arms of a galaxy, they aren't moons or planets, they're beings. And so you instantly know in the sound that's running through you that this is the source, prime creator itself. And you know I am that. You know you came from here. That cannot be denied then you realize you're still hovering around this center as one of these beings. This aspect of you never left, which means you're already there. Then we're moved right through these individual beings, which are vast distance between them, because we're moving right through this energy until we come into the void and we're suddenly shot forward until we're hovering as a group just outside this white island 
And then the whole group of us moves through individual teardrop shaped faculties of whatever this is. And we move through it layer after layer after layer until we enter as atmos into this white core. This is source. And you will always hear a gracious welcome home. It should sound like a deep baritone voice male, but also mixed with the beautiful feminine voice of a woman, but neither. Now, this is not an individual being on a throne. There's no throne chair here. This is a nexus, a connecting point with all atmas running all forms throughout the multiverse. And it is this intelligence, this living presence that we can communicate with but it is not an individual. We are. We're like drops, individual drops in a mighty ocean of the same energy, made of exactly the same energy. And then we find ourselves going higher, moving up above and looking down on this entire galaxy, the ocean of sound and light, source, prime creator, and we suddenly blur, merge into a higher plane. Now this is the realm of the silent mentors. The mechanics of creation, those beings which run and hold in place the grand multidimensional creation itself. All the doorways, all the portals, interdimensional portals, uh, gravitational fields, separation of one galaxy from another, divisions of planes, Barriers like the void between the lower and upper worlds, they maintain all this. And you can see an island surrounded by a glistening golden sand. The cobalt blue atmosphere is far, it's faint, but it's far higher. And you can see these mountains, they're transparent, circling just inside the beach of this golden sand. And as we move over the mountains, you look down and you see these crystal transparent buildings circling the inside of the lower base of the mountains. And there's an island in the center and there's a blue green glowing kind of an energy field. And in the center is another fountain. And silent mentors are moving between and disappearing, going into these buildings and disappearing beyond it and going higher. In the center of this fountain, which is a blue, it's a luminous blue, golden white thing, it's, it's an energy doorway. And there are 12 silent mentors stationed around it at all times. There's an energy coming down into this fountain from above. There's no statue of Satnam here. And then you find yourself all the way down in the physical universe. Hovering above one of my favorite places, planet Oceana in the Milky Way galaxy. On the other side of the galaxy, third higher parallel dimension or time rate. It's a parallel dimension. It's like where Lemuria and Atlantis are that is in a perfect world, you know, with a good moon that's alive. It's in that same level out of 144. And we're hovering above this water-covered, massive, jewel, luminous world, four times bigger than Earth, three moons the size of Earth, no polar ice caps around any of them. And you can see dome cities on some land masses on the moon. On the big world, we're looking down on it. There are several islands near the equator, and you can see in triangular patterns, domes covering pyramids, beautiful walk of botanical paradise between them, and we're going to a central island. And as we hover above the golden sand, which is glowing because all H2O on normal worlds glows a foot above the water. Oceans are naturally kept calm because of this on normal planets. There's no polar ice caps because the temperature around this planet is ideally the same. When you look at one of these domes covering three golden-sided pyramids, the court caps, in the left third of it, you can see several towering above the trees in the distance. And then there's a 
tube-shaped transparent tube running from the jungle right down into the ocean. And then you see Master Opelum appear on this golden sand and point down this tube. This is his world. This is the planet he still has a body on, unaged in 500,000 years. He is one of the founding sponsors of the Galactic Interdimensional Alliance of Free Worlds, which Oceana is part of. And we find ourselves moving inside that tube. It's normally there are transport cars that run down it. But we're getting an idea of where it goes, and you realize it enters a big dome covering three more pyramids, a city, the bottom of the ocean and ocean. And to the left is a volcanic chute, big tube-shaped chute that runs up the side of this island, which is really a mountain. And it's hollowed inside because this is the realm or the home of the Drens, Eta and Din. Inside, it's many miles long, very tall, it's a self-contained ecosystem inside it. The plants produce oxygen, take out the carbon dioxide. The water comes through springs and flows through lakes and waterfalls. There is no need for outside connection to the surface of this world. The Drens evolved in this self-contained ecosystem, but it was the Oceanans who found them in that system that helped them evolve to where they are now. They have a symbiotic relationship, the Drens and the Oceanans. They speak any language, have vocal cords and photographic memories because of the Oceanans. But they were respected and loved and brought up in consciousness, like the, like the say rays would do for human beings. Because the most advanced crystalline-based science in our galaxy, one of the most advanced, probably the most advanced, is the Oceanan science. And so Drens are silica-based creatures. You know, quartz kind of thing at the base of their molecular structure. And so we're walking down a pathway and you can see this huge cavern. It was emptied out from volcanic lava hundreds of millions of years ago. Longer than that. And so it's glowing. The, the moss on the ground has a phosphorescence capability. The water from a waterfall you see in the back of this chamber comes down three tiers and pours into a long oval blue-green lake. There are convex domes, clear domes, all over the walls of this curved chamber in the back behind this waterfall. Those are individual Dren homes. Eten Din are hovering above a path, glowing tails, welcoming you with their hand on their chest to their home. That's the city of On. And we find ourselves out in space, near Earth, looking at the Earth, and it changes from a polar, polar ice caps to one that has no polar ice caps. We've just gone up to a third parallel dimension, this is just a shift of energy consciousness. And there you see a big continent centered over the equator from the left to the right hemisphere. And there's a blue, kind of a green glowing ocean, or beach rather, about a third of the way up from the southern pole. And you can see inland from space, a single snow covered mountain inland several miles. There's a dome to the west, a lower plateau, covering three golden-sided pyramids, quartz cap, which encircle a long, lower, ivory-colored, mm, oval kind of a dome. There's a blue-green lake, an oval lake in the middle of it, and then the countryside's full of these little domed white dwellings and little white pathways. Big trees like giant eucalyptus trees with broad spoon-shaped leaves glowing. The beach you suddenly find your feet on. Remember, there's another continent on the back side of the equator of this planet we call Atla. These two are connected. This is a place that never sank, never had polar flips, and it's still a prototype. Despite the Lemurian Atlantis, all that were destroyed long ago in the world you're familiar with. 
That didn't happen here. And so your feet are wiggling in this emerald green glowing sand, foot above the sand. And it's moving this energy up your legs. And we have a pure energy body that looks perfect, about 36. And it goes up the top of your head. You look up smiling. You're looking at yourself. And you're suddenly in the white core of your being, looking down at your smiling face, looking up at you. And this energy, this gift, goes into the white core of your being and out to that green layer, and it turns on some more of these little teardrop shaped higher faculties of natural knowing certainty. These have command over any negative form that came about after. There's a couple standing on the beach, 10 feet tall, ivory white colored skin, silver hair to their shoulders, violet eyes, beautiful longer necks and torsos and fingers, elegantly dressed. Now this is a gift, this green energy, it comes from a fountain statue down a brown moss covered path that dissects, bisects the uh, jungle trees towards the mountain. And there's a clearing and a white marble floor and in it is a statue carved out of quartz of a woman. She has a band around her forehead with an emerald faceted downward pointing teardrop state jewel in this golden thing that fits around her forehead beautiful white gown on her hands are up with the palms out and there's a glowing green light around them and you realize this device is charging that beach and when you look into the eyes inside this quartz you see the real woman is standing in a green energy field inside it and we find ourselves in a group of beings with Torellian hovering around this woman and then there's a man standing beside her and it's the couple we saw on the beach now they live on a planet called Zetronami One, Zetronomon One. They are from a race called the Zeantronomos. They are in a physical parallel dimension we're in for the planet Earth you're familiar with, but on the other side of the galaxy. And they have the other highest form of crystalline-based science. This couple is showing you a body form they have on their planet that is over three and a half million years old unaged. That's a different type of immortalization. And you find yourself in space looking at the earth you're familiar with, with the polar ice caps and barren moon that orbits the planet and doesn't turn on its axis. The sun in the distance, the white golden light around us, around Torellian. The couple that was standing beside you is still there. The white and golden light of the hue surrounds us. And you find yourself hovering near the ceiling where you live with this couple beside you, both in a physical looking form and the spherical atma. And you realize this energy from where we went from source is being brought down through your head, through the pineal gland, out through the chakras and creating an electromagnetic field. And it keeps moving through you beyond you to three pyramids on earth, two in the bottom of earth's deepest oceans, one in a hollowed interior and a mountain in the Himalayas, and it goes out into space, connects to other pyramids, and eventually goes right up the shaft to the axis of the Milky Way galaxy and returns to where we just came from in a loop, and it never stops moving. So it moves through us for our benefit and on its way for the benefit of others. This is the way the omnipresent first sound or hue, the first power, works. When you're ready, open your eyes. I'm going to stop the recording.